All right, we'll get going. Well, first of all, my name is Michael Otto, and I'm a professor at Boston University in psychology. And for years, my more typical talk in a meeting like this would be about uh, new treatments we were developing for either mood or anxiety disorders. It was about half a decade ago that we, I think, had a, had a preference of a graduate student started looking at the evidence for not what cognitive behavior therapy could do for you and not what medications could do for you, but what moderate exercise could do for you on these fronts of treating mood and anxiety disorders. And as I looked at the literature, I kept being shocked by the evidence that it was just so strong. But it was strong, and it's often in journals that were not in our journals over in psychology and psychiatry. So at that point, being uh, amazed and at times even embarrassed by the, the magnitude of the effects, we started doing more and more work in anxiety and doing our own research, doing much more writing, because you know, there's nothing a person like me hates more than another treatment that's as efficacious as what you're doing, and you're not doing it. So we got on the ball and started doing it. But there's first population-based studies. And these studies take a good look at the population and measure symptoms and measure what people are doing. And lo and behold, those people who are exercising have far fewer symptoms, less depression, less anxiety, less hostility, better sense of connectedness. And we don't really know why on these measures, but if you have less depression, less anxiety, a better sense of well-being, and less hostility, it's hard not to be better connected, right? Because well, you're in a better frame for all your interactions. Now, that's with more scale-based measurements. If you go and you look at disorder-based status out there and say, is there greater or lesser likelihood of being in a disorder, uh, depression, anxiety disorders, et cetera, uh, as an exercise or non exercise or clear difference as well. But these sort of data only get us halfway there. We know there's association, but it may be that when you're in a good mood, you're more likely to make your workout. So we need more experimental level evidence. So what that means is that we take individuals, give half exercise, give half another control condition, and see what happens over time. And indeed, you see the effect. And uh, one of our early contributions to literature was a meta-analysis where we pick out literature, all the trials that meet certain criteria for quality, uh, where people have been randomized to treatments. And you get this huge effect size, huge benefit for starting a pro program of exercise when depressed. Anxiety disorders research, in many ways, is behind that for depression, depending on how you look at it. There's lots of trials of anxiety, anxiety in medical populations. This is not the psychiatry clinic I came in for an anxiety disorder. But for broad-based anxiety, we have lots of evidence, nice effect sizes. More recently, there have been the trials of anxiety patients, panic disorders, probably the cleanest trial, good evidence for the efficacy of exercise to help panic disorder. There's lots of trials underway, including post-traumatic stress disorder now, some of our colleagues are doing, a little bit of preliminary evidence and generalized anxiety disorder, other disorders, so very promising on that front. If we think of the average exercise prescription, it's often for, hey, 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 you know, your weight is getting up there. I don't like the look of your blood work. Let's get you to exercise. So exercise for, to lose weight, to look buff on the beach, um, those sorts of outcomes, not very good for motivation um, because you have to do a lot of work to get there, a lot of work. You have to work out and 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 work out. Then you look a little different. Doesn't have the type linkage. So we have to differentiate motivation for the outcome. We all may want to look buff on the beach or whatever it might be, but then separately is the motivation for the process and to stay with it to get there. And your ability to do that depends on the linkage. How soon between the workout and the payoff to get yourself to do it? And as I said, to get the health boost, a lot, a lot of weeks of workout before you get the payoff. The really good news is that the linkage is tremendously tighter for mood effects. When you work out, you should feel a mood burst on average uh, within five, 10 minutes afterwards. Culturally, when we talk about a motivation, we have some very odd notions about it. Very popular, very common, but very odd. Hey, Michael, you want to go to the gym this afternoon? Well, there's this idea of checking my motivation. Let me check just a second. Oh, I'm just a little low. Yeah, I would, but yeah, I was at 80% of being with sorry. Or I'm waiting for it. Um, you want to go work out when? 4.30. Well, okay, let's say I hope my motivation gets here by then because it's not here now, like waiting on a train. Or this odd idea of digging deep, like you're, you're waiting for a geyser. Like, you're, oh, I hope, yes, I got some motivation. 
That's not how I want you to think of motivation, and that's not the way of thinking of motivation supported by research. In fact, the problem is if you know, some of you are not working out, often the motivation is not too low to work out. The problem is that you have too many motivations, and other motivations are above the motivation to work out. There's lots of stuff I can do while I write, while I do my other academic work. I can listen to music. But the one thing I cannot do is read. I cannot read for pleasure. It interferes with anything else I have to do. So at some point, I think I'll be more efficient. Um, I'll get my reading time in, and I'll listen to uh, books on CD in my car is how I started. Then I found myself sitting in the parking structure for a half hour trying to finish something that was really cool. The smartest thing I ever did relative to my workout status came when I, I was doing a girl, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo series. And those of you that read that, it is hard to put down, very hard to put down. But the rule I made is that, sure, you want to read, and you can read as long as you want with your, your, your book on CD, that can, your audio book, as long as you're running. So the only motivational intervention I had to do is keep the uh, it, it's sad, because I started with a little CD player, so I had to run like this, because you get a crooked, it doesn't somehow. <laughs> but I just, if I kept that in my gym bag, and that's the only place I got to read in that way, I'd run a long, long time. I started packing extra CDs in my running jacket so I could trade while I was out there. That's combining two different motivations together to make it easier for me to get out there and stay with it. And all that together defines some of these pre-exercise strategies to help someone. But that's not enough. What do you do during exercise itself? Now, good research suggests that pleasure ratings predict whether someone stays with a workout. And, and let me, to predict something over six months and a year is hard in psychology. This prediction of your pleasure during an index workout session predicted whether you stayed with exercise both six months and a year down the road. Very powerful. So pleasure during an exercise, very important. And I keep talking about running, but there's lots of other things to do, either with groups or without, to make your exercise period a lot more fun. And so we need to be broad when we think about, and, and you all know this, the red, white, blue, the value of team, of social connection, of working out with someone, of course, makes a huge difference. As during exercise, finally, let's talk post-exercise. This is the ability we need anyway. When we're with patients, it's like a diagnostic. When they do something good, can they say, I did something good? If I do something well, can they say, I did it well? Um, so the self-coaching of being able to say, wow, I did it. Not, wow, my times are off my high school best still at this age. Of course they are. Right? So, Everybody has to watch perfection. Perfection can sap the fun of almost anything when your criteria get too high. Um, remembrance of where you were before you got out of shape or overweight can sap your self-evaluation. I did it, and what I call echoing. Echoing refers to the concept that there's a good thing that happened, and then you think of it again. So it's good, 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 good. When, that's not our strong suit. right? If, I, if I'd assess what you all think about at a stoplight when you have a moment, Stoplight, at the end of the day, you're often thinking about the worst aspect of your day. I can't believe that happened. No, no. And so you're echoing this negative moment over and over again. We like, in our, in our more broader treatment, to get people to echo what's effective and going well in their life, that sort of rehearsal. You certainly need to echo some exercise. Um, and even all of us are good at, if you work out regularly, reinterpreting the fatigue. Like you say, oh man, I'm tired of that. And you think, oh, but that was a good workout. Right? That you have that little spin ready for how you think about how your body feels. That's important to pass on to people to help them stay with the exercise.